different things. I'm pretty one-dimensional, and uh, for 34 consecutive years, I was in the pastor. I started pastoring my first church the month I turned 20, uh, barely out of my teens, and I started pastoring. I uh, didn't know what I was doing then, and pretty well figured out I wasn't going to ever know what I was doing. And it's just something you go with the flow, tending the sheep, and we greatly appreciate it. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to the greatest sermon that has ever been preached. Uh, turn to Matthew chapter number 6. Matthew chapter 6. And really we're going to re- use Matthew 6 and just three words that are said out of Matthew 6 as a springboard into 16 great principles of the Word of God about prayer. I mentioned Friday night that a dear friend of mine was a friend of Miss Bertha Smith. Miss Bertha Smith was a lifelong missionary in China, and at the time of her mandatory retirement age, she came home and she started a prayer retreat in Calpen, South Carolina. What Miss Bertha did in her life in walking with the Lord and her deep, deep prayer life was pretty amazing. It was absolutely incredible. Well, my friend had her notes and he passed her notes on to me and they're some of the greatest notes about prayer that you'll ever find. And and while I certainly am, am speaking from my own experience, I am speaking from the Word of God and I'm using some of what Miss Bertha taught in her prayer seminars, but uh, Jesus said this, Jesus said in in Matthew chapter 6, and look down in verse 5, in verse 5 at the beginning of that verse, and when you pray, would you just say that with me, and And when when you pray, pray. now look down in verse 6, but you, when you pray, say that one. When you pray. And then look down at the next verse, verse 7. And when you pray. Say that. And when you pray. There is an expectation. There is an expectation by Jesus Christ that we're going to pray. Now in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus Christ would also say, And when you fast. And He taught us about fasting. He said, And when you give. He taught us about giving. The disciplines of the faith that Jesus Christ taught us, that the Word of God taught us, have not passed away. They haven't gone anywhere. It is still the will of God that we pray, that we fast, that we give. And uh, what we're concentrating on this morning in this Sunday school hour, in this life group hour, and what we're concentrating on in the hour that we will have in worship is this discipline of prayer. A lot of people like to attend seminars about prayer. A lot of people like to read about prayer. But few people pray. We know this because we've asked folks, how's your prayer life? Uh, last church I pastor was First Baptist Church of Sevierville. And I was there for almost a decade, and it's just one of the greatest churches in the country. I mean, it's one of the, they, they got such harmony there. They got such an incredible, long serving staff there. And uh, generous as they could possibly be. Uh, they give 10% through the cooperative program. Their Lottie Moon Christmas offering, they gave $480,000 this past year. They're, they're, they have a goal that the sun never sets on, on their mission endeavors. And they've got teams out every month going somewhere in the world. It is a great, great church. But in my second year there, we had a deacon's retreat. We had about 50 deacons, those actively serving, those not serving at the time, and their wives were on retreat. And I just did a survey among them. How, do, how many of you men pray with your wives? These were the deacons, the cream of the crop. And 80% of those deacons said they do not pray on a regular basis with their wives. You'll see in the study that that is a fatal flaw. Because the scripture says that you must dwell with them with understanding, talking to the husbands about the wives, so that your prayers be not hindered. If things aren't right at home, they're not going to be right in heaven. I mean, if if there's a problem at home, then there's going to be a problem between you and your conversation and your relationship with Almighty God. Let me read you a quote that, uh, that I picked up. 
Um, the, it, it was just amazing. This, this quote said, and it is, um, it is said that prayer without work is ashes, and work without prayer is a dream. But behold his proportion. This is what Jesus did. He lived on earth for about 33 and a half years. He ministered, he taught, he performed miracles for about three and a half years. And yet the scripture said he's been living to make intercession for us for over 2,000 years. He lived on earth a sinless life. He died on the cross of Calvary. He was resurrected from the grave. He ascended back to the Heavenly Father. He did all of His teaching, all of His miracles, all of His preaching, all of His living in three and a half years on this earth. And yet, He Himself has been praying for 2,000 years. Do you see the importance of prayer? Do you know that the, more, that the disciples, more than anything else, they wanted Jesus to teach them how to pray? They never asked Jesus to teach them how to preach. They never asked Jesus, teach us to teach. They never said to Jesus, teach us how to cast out demons. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. They saw in his own life that the most important thing to Jesus was his time alone with the Father. I look at that truth and I think, Randy Davis, you are such a fool not to pray more. You've got your priorities all mixed up when you do not allow yourself enough time to seek God. Now some of you are thinking, well, I'm just too busy to give a whole lot of time to prayer. Listen, the busier you are, the more you need to pray. The busier you are in kingdom work, the more you need to pray. Let me give you these 16 laws of prayer right from the scripture in pretty rapid fashion because I know that our time is somewhat limited. Our prayers should be persistent. Our prayers should be persistent. Do you know the last prayer in the Bible is a prayer that we've been praying for over 2,000 years? The last prayer of the Bible is found in the last few verses of the book of Revelation when John said, Even so, Lord Jesus, come. That's the last prayer of the Bible. The prayer's been going on for 2,000 years. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, it's been going on that long. Maybe he's not coming back again. Maybe uh, we missed it. Maybe we didn't quite understand what he was saying about him coming back again. He's coming back again. He, Jesus Christ is visibly coming back again. The angels, as he ascended back to heaven... The angel said, you men of Galilee, why do you stand here gazing up into the heavens? For this same Jesus will so come in like manner. He's coming back again. Our prayers should be persistent. Keep praying no matter how long it takes. There was a man that was saved in a meeting out in a west, small town out west. And uh, he was an older man. And when he was saved and he came to Christ, another older man came up to him. And said to him, I don't know if you remember me, but we all grew up together. I want you to know that when you were a teenager, there were 25 of us that committed to pray for you every day that you would be saved. And this one older man said to the older man just been saved, I'm the only one of the 25 that are left to see this day. You see, they kept praying and the Heavenly Father came through. Listen to uh, this verse of Scripture. And I say to you, keep on asking and it will be given to you. Keep on seeking and you will find. Ever continue knocking and it shall be opened unto you. God has called on us to keep on knocking, to keep on seeking, to keep on praying, to keep on, don't stop praying. Whatever you're seeking God for, keep seeking Him for it. When I was a little boy, uh, I was very involved in baseball, Little League, and my dad was very involved in that league. Matter of fact, he started the Dixie Youth League in the town that I grew up in. And uh, in between games, we'd be running around as little boys playing, and they had a little concession stand there. My dad was always talking to some other men about something. I remember I'd go up to him and I'd say, Dad, can I have a quarter? I'd pull on his sleeve. Dad, can I have a quarter? Dad, can I have a quarter? I want to go use something to drink or eat or something like that. And... And he would, he would not hardly look at me, but I'd keep saying, going I have a quarter? And finally, 
He would reach into his pocket, and as he continued to talk, he'd just give me whatever was in his pocket. I always came out much better than if he'd been paying attention. <laughs> but it's always 50 cents or a dollar or two dollars because I just kept on and kept on. Our Heavenly Father wants us to keep on being persistent. But not only does He want us to be persistent, the second thing is He wants us to be insistent. He wants us to, to have a passion about our prayer. The Bible says the fervent prayer of a righteous man is mighty in its working in James 5.16. Someone put it like this. When we... Uh, um, we must be desperate in prayer. We must wrestle when we must be outspoken, shameless, and passionate. Many of the prayers of the Old Testament and New Testament are, quote, cries, and the Hebrew and Greek words are very strong. Despite many books' opinions to the contrary, the Bible knows such a thing as storming heaven, praying through. Old timers used to talk about grabbing the horns of the altar and not letting go until God came through. You see, God wants us to be passionately insistent. God desires us to have a burden for that which we are praying for. In Hebrews 5, 7, the Bible says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered in prayers and supplications, with strong crying and in tears. We've got a high priest, according to the book of Hebrews, that, that really understands our heart. He identifies with us. And the Bible says in Hebrews that he ever liveth to make intercession for us. When we pray persistently and insistently, what we're doing is lining up our will with the will of the Heavenly Father and we're asking God to come through like no one else. That verse in Hebrews chapter 4 verses 15 and 16 says, For we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy find grace to help in the time of need. He says, look, we can come boldly before His throne. That does not mean arrogantly. Understand that. I cringe when I hear people making demands of God. I cringe when people go before God and they say, God, I demand based on Your Word that You do thus and such. When the prodigal son came home to be in a right relationship with his father, he said, Lord, make me as a hired servant. I'm not worthy to be called your son. It was at that point of great humility when he did come back into the presence of the father that the father lavished on him everything the father could and recognized that he was a son and he wasn't going to be a servant. So pray persistently. Pray insistently. But pray, pray with resistance. What do you mean pray with resistance? We have an enemy out there and his name is Satan. Satan does not want you to pray. As long as you don't pray, he doesn't care what you preach. As long as you don't pray, he doesn't care what you do kingdom wise. Because he knows that everything is going to be like wood, hay, and stubble if it is not motivated, if it is not Filled if it is not covered, if it is not saturated with prayer. Everything we do is a waste of time if we are not praying at the same time. The scripture says this, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against wicked spirits, that's in the Greek, in heavenly places. Ephesians six twelve. Your mind is an airport. You are the control tower. And anything Satan will throw at you, you've got the ability to reject it or receive it. You see, what you do in your prayer life and how strong your prayer life is is dependent upon you. You must, when Satan throws those darts, when Satan brings in his 
aircraft to try to land on your mind to distract you and discourage you, you must reject it. In the name of Christ, you must say, no, you don't have a right to land here in the name of Jesus Christ and by His blood, you are not going to have access to my mind and my heart. Let me tell you the truth. God has never discouraged anybody. Did you hear that? God has never discouraged anybody. Our God is a God of encouragement. God never discourages anybody. Discouragement is a tool of Satan. If Satan can get you discouraged, he can get you defeated. Satan is also the father of distraction. God doesn't distract you from that thing which is primary on his heart. When you pray, I, I promise you that when you pray, you're going to walk into an, uh, a spiritual warfare place. You're going to walk into an arena of spiritual warfare because Satan does not want you to pray. When the disciples went with Jesus into the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus spent his prayer time in prayer, he said to the disciples, what could you not watch with me for an hour? Could you not watch and pray for just an hour? Over a dozen times in Scripture, the word watch there is associated with praying. What it means is staying alert while you're praying. What it means is that you're tuned in to what, you, what, what you're praying about, that you're not going to be distracted. Listen to this. The Scripture says um, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, but he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil leaveth him. The devil leaves him. When you walk into the spiritual uh, warfare kind of realm, what is it that you need to do to defeat the devil? You need to be in the Word. Now, if you're just getting into the Word and you haven't been in the Word before and you start reading a little bit every day, um, I want to encourage you to get a few verses of Scripture that you can hang your hat on. Just a verse or two of the promises of God that when Satan comes at you, you can, at that point in time, you can come back to Satan with the Word of God and you can defeat him. The Bible says that he will flee. You must be persistent. You must be insistent. And you must be desistent. You, you must uh, not be distracted as you pray. You must watch. I found one of the greatest distractions in the world is our cell phones. Uh, my wife and I have started noticing and, and I've gotten to the place where if I go out with her to eat, I leave my cell phone in the car. I don't even take it in with me. It's too much of a temptation to find out what's happening in Akron, Ohio, if I've got my cell phone with me. It's, uh, and, and, and even when I go into a place to pray, I don't take my cell phone with me. And the reason is because, you know, you got all those notifications. I know you can turn the notifications off, but we don't do it. An email pops up, a text pops up, a weather alert pops up, and all of a sudden we're trying to find it out. I've gotten to the place in my life where I go into a certain room at a certain time and I meet the Lord there and I don't carry anything with me but my Bible. And in the worship service, I'll tell you why I carry my Bible with me when I go pray. It'll be the very first thing in the notes in the worship time that we look at. We look at the book before we pray. We need the book as we pray and sometimes we pray the book back to the Father when we don't know what else to pray. Our prayers should be Resistant. Second, the, the fourth thing is this. Our prayers should be desistant. Prayers should be resistant. And then fourthly, desistant. What do you mean by desistant? I mean this. I mean you don't run ahead of God. You don't run ahead of Him. Do you remember Abraham praying that God would give him a son? And the promise of God to Abraham was, I'm going to give you a son. But you see, Sarah cried for God to have a son. Sarah cried that God would give her a son, and Abraham was going to help God out. And he went into Sarah's handmaiden, Hagar, and he produced a child by Hagar. That was not the will of the Heavenly Father. That was Abraham trying to answer his own prayer. 
I was in contact with a Tennessee pastor yesterday, and the Tennessee pastor was talking about having a certain conversation with somebody, and and uh, when he had this conversation, it was not going to be good. I know it wasn't going to be good. And he says, but God seems to be closing the door. And I said to him, maybe you're trying to get ahead of God and fo- solve something you've already been praying for. Why don't you just wait for God to answer your prayer? You know, we must wait on God. The very first thing about being persistent, that is a matter of waiting on God. Don't, get a, don't pray something and then help God figure it out. When Moses and the children of Israel were at, were at the Red Sea, did he tell everybody to grab a bucket and start bailing water out of the Red Sea? No, he waited on God to deliver him. When they were marching around the walls of Jericho, did God tell them to push on the walls? Oh, no. God said, you just march around. He had a pres- prescription that had nothing to do with the way we would have done it as humans. It, was, it didn't make any sense. But when it was all said and done, Jericho was defeated. Wait on God to come through so that when God comes through and your prayers are answered, nobody's going to get the glory for it but God. Not somebody else, but God. Our prayers should be specific. The scripture says, well, in Luke chapter 11, do you remember the man that went to his neighbor and he said, give me three loaves of bread? Remember that story? He didn't, he didn't say, give me bread. He said, give me three loaves of bread. He was very specific. Don't pray, God forgive me of my sins. Don't pray that. God wants to know what sins you're talking about. If the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, it is a specific sin. When the Holy Spirit reveals to you your sin, or the Scripture reveals to you your sin, then friend, you need to confess that particular sin to God. There are no blanket pardons. God forgives us for specific sins. When the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, that he is, if we confess our sins, the word there is not referring to some generalization of sin, but very specific sin. If you were to ask the Holy Spirit about what sins are in your life, to reveal to you what sins, the Holy Spirit would not say, well, you're a sinner in general. The Holy Spirit would say, as a child of God, here's where you've sinned. Here's the lying, here's the envy, here's the lust. Here's the sin of the flesh. He would specifically point out to you your sins. By the same token, when you go to God and you pray, pray pray for things specifically. Uh, As I mentioned before, I was in the pastor for 34 years, and we were having the time of our lives at First Baptist Sevierville. From our front porch, you could see Mount Lacotte. From our back porch, you could see English Mountain. Uh, uh, you could hear the train whistle from Dollywood from our yard. I mean, we, we were just loving it in Sevierville. We uh, had a great, great, great church. I can't tell you how close we were to the staff and what a great <laughs> unity there was in that fellowship. We'd have about 2,000 people in worship on Sunday morning, and we'd always have about 20 or 25 different states represented in four or five countries, the tourists coming to that area. I mean, it was a great, great ministry, but God, out of the blue, led us to be involved in a mission, denominational kind of ministry. It was not on my bucket list to do what I'm doing right now, but God led us to do what we're doing right now. My wife, I'm sorry you hadn't had a chance to meet Jeannie. She, she has more energy than anybody I've ever met. She's a remarkable lady. Uh, she was raised Catholic, saved just before we uh, were, was coming to the Lord about the time we got to know each other and was saved about the time uh, we were falling in love. And then she went from being a Roman Catholic to being a Baptist preacher's wife almost overnight. The day she knelt down at the side of the pew and made the sign of the cross in our first little church was a day that I almost had a heart attack and died. <laughs> She just forgot it was kind of habit, but she's a, she's a wonderful lady, and she has loved being a pastor's wife because um, she just gets to be her. She's never seen a pastor's wife. She's never seen one modeled, and, and she was delivered from those preconceived ideas. Well, when we were sitting on the front pew of our last 
Sunday in, at First Baptist Church of Sevierville, she was cried her eyes out. She cried at every church that we left. She just falls in love with the people, and she was crying her eyes out. And as she was crying her eyes out, I leaned over and I said, you know this is your fault. <laughs> she stopped and said, what do you mean it's my fault? I said, for the last 10 years, we've been praying we'd live near the children. Now, our youngest daughter and our only granddaughter at the time and, and our daughter's husband lived uh, just outside of the Nashville area. I said, you've been praying for 10 years we'd live near the kids. Now we're moving to where the kids live. And she said, I thought that God would move them here. <laughs> I said, well, you got to get specific. You just prayed we'd live near the kids. You didn't say anything about moving here. You see, when you get, you, our prayers must be specific. That's why a prayer list is so vitally impro important. The seventh thing is our prayers should be in the name of the Lord Jesus. I like this. When all else fails, his name prevails. When all else fails, his name prevails. This is what the scripture says in John 14, 13, and 14. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. When it is in His name and for His glory, He will do it. There is no possible way that you can isolate and minimize the words whatsoever and anything. They're in the book. That's what He said. If you ask anything in My name, whatever you ask in My name and for the glory of the Father, I will do it. Our Lord Jesus Christ is a man of sacred honor. And when he makes a promise like that, he absolutely means it. So we are to pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. We're to be insistent, we're to be desistent, we're to be persistent. We're to ask in the name of the Father, we're to be very specific. And then number eight, we are to pray in faith. We're to pray in faith. The scripture says, all things are possible to him that believeth. All things are possible to him that believeth. Listen, he's made provision for our weak faith. He's made provision for our unbelief. His word. You go back to His Word and you get a word from God about anything that makes up for our lack of faith. I don't, I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen, but this is what God has said in His Word and this is what I'm hanging on to. This is what God has told me and this is what I believe. The Bible says, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. In Mark 11, he says, have faith in God. So if we don't have enough faith, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And by the way, you don't have to have a mountain of faith. All you have to do is have a grain of mustard seed of faith to move a mountain. Uh, I think it's a lie born in the pits of hell for somebody to say to you, you just don't have enough faith. A grain of mustard seed of faith is possible for anybody to have. If you've just got a little bit of faith, God will come through. For us to say, well, I, I now have enough faith so that mountain's going to be removed, who do you think that puts the attention on? That puts the attention on you. That gives you the glory because you now have enough faith. All it takes is just a little bit of faith. All it takes is just getting a word from God and saying, God, I trust you. Pray in faith, trusting the will of the Heavenly Father. The Bible says, if ye abide in me, and my word abides in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done <laughs> unto you. John 15, 7. The word for done in the scripture is sometimes translated create. In other words... Um, 
God takes our prayers and creates out of nothingness an answer to our prayers. Trust Him. We are to pray pleading the promises of God. We're to pray in faith and we are to pray pleading the promises of God. The Bible, uh, someone has said, one authority says there are exactly 7,487 promises from God to man in the Bible. If you want to set out on a great adventure of this every day, read three chapters in the Bible a day. Start in Genesis and then go to Psalms, and then in Matthew, reading three chapters a day at those beginning points, you'll have read the Scripture through uh, in a year's time if you'll do that. Start in Genesis, read a chapter. Go to Psalms, read a chapter. Go to Matthew, read a chapter. You do that every day, and you'll read the Scripture all the way through. Let me challenge you, whatever you're doing in reading the Scripture highlight and circle and underscore one of these 7,500 promises in the Word of God and put FM by each one of those promises. FM, for me. That's what that means, for me. This promise given to me by God is for me. The Lord said... Um, for he hath said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, in Hebrews 13, 5. The literal meaning of that is this. I will not, I will not, I will not leave you. I will not, I will not, I will not forsake you. In the Greek language, there's an emphasis given to that verse of Scripture that we don't find translated in the English. I will not, I will not, I will not leave you. I will not, I will not, I will not forsake you. Our Heavenly Father is not our Heavenly Father, is not our Heavenly Stepfather. He's not one that will be here today and then gone tomorrow. He is here constantly and forever. In Psalms 37 alone, Psalms 37, write that down, Psalms 37 there are over 40 promises that we can claim in that one psalm. In psalm 37. We should pray pleading the promises of God. Number 10. We should pray without dictating to God how He's going to answer the prayer. In John chapter 4 verse 46, the Bible says, Sir, I come down ere, uh, Sir, come down ere my child die. But the Lord did not have to go to the sick child. The Lord said, your son is made well. Your son liveth. He's okay. The man said, God, you come to my child and you heal my child. But the, but the Lord spoke it and it happened. He didn't have to be there. Don't prescribe to God how He's going to answer your prayer. And when you pray, leave it at the altar. Leave it at the feet of the Father. Don't pick it up and take it back so that you can figure out how it's going to happen. Trust God to come through for you. Pray without dictating to God how it's going to happen. Number 11. We should pray realizing that our Father is a mighty God whose resources are limitless. When we pray, we should pray realizing that our Father is a mighty God whose resources are limitless. In Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, the scripture says, Our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can think, ask, or hope through Christ Jesus in the church for His honor and for His glory. Our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above. Now, exceedingly abundantly above, I think, is not good grammar, but it is great theology. What it means is that God gives to us in super abundance. Um, most of our churches are not over-challenged. Most of our churches are under-challenged. 
most of us look at our churches and their situation and we think, well, you know, here are our limitations. Have you ever prayed for something that was so big it was doomed for failure unless God came through? <coughs> Have you ever insistently, persistently, with a burdened heart and a broken heart and a contrite spirit gone to God and ask God for something so large you were going to be a, made a fool if He didn't come through. I mean, you were going to have egg on your face. People were going to talk about what, uh, how, how foolish you were to ask God for that. You look at all of the great prayer warriors and how they trusted God and the things they prayed for. It was massive and it was big. The problem with the church in North America is we've gotten so used to what we can do, we don't trust what He can do. We can do most everything in the church today without Him. Because it is all based on our own talent, our own gifts, our own strengths, our own resources. But our God is able to do beyond anything we can dream up or imagine. Anything that we can possibly dream, our God is able to do. We are to pray realizing that our Father is a mighty God whose resources are limitless. And then number 12, we are to pray according to God's will. Now, let me say quickly that uh, praying in the will of the Heavenly Father is not a cop-out. It is not something you attach on to the end of your prayer so that uh, if, if your prayers are not answered, you can just shrug your shoulders and say, well, it must not have been the will of the Father. People that have been in prayer a long time, prayer warriors, have said we ought to begin our prayers with your will, Father. Not my will be done, but yours be done. And just declare from the very outset, God, I'm interested in seeing your will accomplished, my, not my will accomplished. The scripture says this, At the very beginning of Colossians, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of His will. Paul and Praying this prayer at the very beginning of Colossians says, you know what, we've been praying that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will. You pray according to God's will. Now, every prayer you pray in the name of Jesus for the will of the Father is going to be answered. Sometimes it's going to be yes, and sometimes it's going to be no, and sometimes it's going to be not now. But every prayer you pray will be answered. Thirteen. We should pray until we can praise God for an answer. The scripture says, Therefore I say to you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you shall receive. Then, and ye shall have them. Therefore I say to you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe, then you will receive them. And you shall have them. Mark eleven twenty four. Psalms thirty seven five says, Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. <clears throat> the, the word there from Psalms thirty seven about uh, committing your way into the Lord means literally to roll it on to him. It means to give it to Him. The New Testament says cast all your cares upon the Lord because He cares for you. When you pray, pray until you can praise Him for the answers. <coughs> True faith not only asks but also receives. Pray in such... This is why it's important to pray specifically. How are you going to know if He answers your prayer if you pray generally? If you don't keep some kind of record of, of your prayer life and your prayer list, how are you going to know when God answers your prayer? Bruce Wilkerson, a prolific writer, brought to a conference I was at his prayer notebooks. 
And he had boxes of spiral bound notebooks that go all the way back to when he was in his 20s. I'm guessing Bruce Wilkerson now is like 65, 70 years of age. And all of these notebooks went back to when he was maturing in the Lord and he kept all these lists and he could go back and tell you what happened with every single one of those prayer requests. Now why do we want to know again when our prayers are answered? So that we can hold up our notebooks and say, look what a mighty prayer warrior I am. All these requests have been, have been answered. Oh no. It's so that we can say, look what God has done. So that we can praise Him for answers to our prayer. Number 14. We should pray with a desire to please and obey God. The scripture says, And whatever you ask, you receive of Him, because we keep His commandment and do the things which are pleasing in His sight. 1 John 3.22 We receive an answer because He can trust us. We've been obedient to Him. We've kept His commandments. And so He answers our prayers. He hears as we obey. As we obey. Some of you want to be mightily used of God, but you're not but God's you're not being faithful in the small things. When I went away to college, I grew up in South Alabama and went to a small Baptist college in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, William Carey University College back then. And um, I knew it was God's will that I sink my life into a church there. And so I joined First Baptist Church of Hattiesburg. I knew it was God's will that I get involved somehow as a freshman in college. And so I started teaching RAs on Wednesday nights, Royal Ambassadors. Uh, the, they gave me a book there. They were glad I was volunteering to teach RAs and threw me in a room with about 37th and 8th graders. <coughs> 37th and 8th grade boys, I might add. And I was 18. And I was their RA leader. And I thought, Lord, I'm going to do the best I can with this. And we did. We saw several of those young men come to Christ. Uh, they got into memorizing Scripture. And uh, for about nine months, I had the time of my life. And then it was summertime. And then the next year, I was married and pastoring in the middle of my sophomore year in college. But I knew with all of my heart that I needed to be faithful to that task of teaching the RAs on Wednesday night. Because if God couldn't trust me with that, how could He trust me with pastoring a church? How could He trust me with anything else? You need to be faithful right where you are until God reassigns you or calls you home. You see, our prayers being answered and being heard from God are in correlation to our being obedient to Him in the will that He's revealed to us to this point. Number 15. We can pray with authority. The Bible teaches that it is not only in the future day, but now that we can reign as kings in life by one, even Christ Jesus, according to Romans 5.17. We reign right now as kings in Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 45 the Bible says, Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands. Command ye me. The Lord has said that we can come to Him with, with uh, confidence and we have this authority that's been given to us by our prayers. We can resist the devil. We can, uh, we can defeat that which discourages us and which distracts us. When we pray, we're to pray in authority. Listen, when we pray in Jesus' name... That is where our authority is. If there is an ambassador assigned from the United States of America in some other part of the country, do you realize that that ambassador goes with the full weight and the full authority of the United States of America? That ambassador is not in that foreign land by themselves. This planet is not our home. This planet is not it for us. We, have, we are here on assignment from the God of this universe, and we are here in His name and by His authority. 16 good biblical truths. So what are you going to pray about? This week, who are you going to pray for? What are you going to pray about? 
in the worship hour, what we're going to do is we're going to take about uh, four or five steps and uh, just kind of modeling or showing how we can pray and how we should organize our prayer time in such a manner that we're going to cover most all the bases. But what are you going to pray about? How are you going to personalize it? Right now, if you were to make out a list, what would you be praying about? In the couple of minutes we've got left, what would you praise the Lord for? What would you thank the Lord for? You know the Bible says enter into His presence with thanksgiving. What would you be thankful for? You know, when we, when we enter into His presence in thanksgiving, that immediately sets the tone for our prayer time because it's a prayer time where we are thanking God, where we're praising Him. When you start counting your blessings, it changes everything. You can be in the worst mood, having the worst day, just really sour on everything, and you don't even like who you are. You don't, you don't even want to be with you, it's so bad. <laughs> How do you get beyond that? You start thanking the Lord, you count your many blessings, you name them one by one. Uh, then you praise the Lord for what He's done, you thank Him. And then you start praying for others. Get your mind off yourself and start praying for others. Normally, we begin our prayer time by praying for us. Begin it by interceding, praying for others. Put yourself last. You be the last one you pray for. Confession is a strong part of, of our making things right with God. So what are you going to be praying for? Let me share with you one, one last thing to show you the power of prayer. And I might mention this in the in this service if I do forgive me, but uh, I've seen a statistic lately that said that half of all marriages in the United States end in divorce and half of uh, all church members' marriages end in divorce. Well, that's true if you count all church members of all churches, but it is not true when you isolate those that's, that are regular church attenders, that are regular in their word, and that are regular prayers, that are involved in a ministry, the divorce rate goes way, way down. A matter of fact, I've seen this statistic slightly different in a lot of different surveys of the couples that pray together, of the man and wife couples that pray together, only one out of 1,150 end in divorce. So you've gone from one out of every two to one out of every 1,100 plus if you're praying together. That's a good word. Well, folks, my father's house will be called a house of prayer. Keep on praying. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your blessing us. And God, I thank you for being with us today. God, you promise where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst. And so we have confidence that because of what we find in your word, that great promise is being realized right now in this room. Now, Father, uh, we don't know the hurts, the hang-ups, or the problems that are represented by these dear people in this room. And I can imagine that some are in such <coughs> spiritual warfare right now that the rest of us have no idea. God, some may have wounds that are so deep that it's hard for the rest of us to fathom. God, you know. You're an empathizing, sympathizing Jesus. And I, I just pray right now for my brothers and sisters. Now, Lord, uh, give us a great time of worship in the next hour. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.